We are picking up with part three of changes in attitudes and values as a result of the Industrial Revolution. And this time we're going to focus on changes in education and also the debate between religion and science. During the Industrial Revolution, education expands. We now have public elementary and secondary education for all boys and girls. And if you look quickly at these pictures, you'll see that in many ways public education looks very similar to how it did 200 years ago with books and bells and classrooms with teachers and students. And notice that here's a little girl who is taking notes, which is exactly what you are supposed to be doing on that chart that you were given to complete for homework. The big difference between education then and now, however, is that education for women was limited to certain ladylike endeavors rather than serious academics. Women were expected to be able to teach their own small children to sing, to dance, to read. They were also the ones who taught religion. As a natural progression from this widespread public education, Many colleges were founded in the 1800s. Go ahead and ask someone you know right now who's applying to a college what year the college they're looking at was founded. And nine times out of ten, you'll see it was sometime in the 1800s. And this is not just liberal arts colleges, but also technical and trade schools, too. However, women were not admitted. This frustrated many very smart women who wanted to learn more. So they would actually go to college campuses and stand outside the windows of classrooms and listen to the lectures from outside. Ultimately, the natural laws of supply and demand prevailed and colleges just for women were established, often as the sister school to a male-only institution. Women weren't entirely respected but no one wanted to pass up on the tuition dollars. As you might expect, there's a renewed interest in science as a result of the Industrial Revolution, and not just for industry. New theories about the natural world um, are investigated as well. We have atomic theory. We're dating the Earth to a couple billion years old. We've got Neanderthal bones being discovered in 1856. But by far, the most disturbing new idea with long, long, long-standing consequences came from this man. You want to guess? You're looking at a picture of Charles Darwin. Now, in 1831, Darwin was chosen to be part of a team aboard the HMS Beagle, which was traveling from England to South America on this five-year expedition to map and study previously unknown parts of these regions. Darwin's job was the ship's naturalist. He was to collect specimens, make observations, and keep very careful records of anything he observed that he thought was significant. On this trip in particular, Darwin observed the aftermath of an earthquake, where he found fossils in the upturned land. The fossil remains were of animal species that were similar to known animals and yet also had different characteristics and were often either larger or smaller than known species. These observations caused Darwin to conclude that major environmental changes like earthquakes would result in animal species having to adapt to new conditions. He theorized that by chance a bird, for example, you know, randomly born with a slightly longer bill, would fare better in the new or stressed environment. They would survive and reproduce, while other birds who did not have the random adaptation would eventually die off. Now, this is a bit of an oversimplification of the science, but what we are going to focus on is sort of the aftermath of this revelation. Absolute uproar as a result of kind of the obvious, which is the fact that this definitely clashed with what was taught in the Bible, and so we have scientists and theologians arguing. But secondly, and more important to history, Herbert Spencer and others apply Darwin's ideas to society. They talk about survival of the fittest in the human race, not just the animal race. This at first is called social Darwinism. It's really just racism or the belief that one social group is better and should dominate over another social group.